All right, well, it's me again, and actually, I'm glad to be here. I hope you're glad to be here, too. Um, last time, we started off with some riddles, and um, I would say I got a lot of positive feedback from those riddles, but I, I'm in church, and I don't want to lie. Um, actually, I didn't get any feedback at all from the riddles, so without any encouragement, I'm just going to go ahead and do some more riddles. All right, here's the first riddle. What kind of lights did Noah have on the ark? What kind of lights did Noah have on the ark? Floodlights. That's a good one. All right, we can use, you, you feel free to use some of these um, in your own ministries. Um, question number two, why couldn't Jonah trust the ocean? Remember the story of Jonah? Why couldn't Jonah trust the ocean? He just knew there was something fishy about it. All right, we, you, can, yeah, you, you can use that one too. All right, the third question. What did Adam say on the day before Christmas? What did Adam say on the day before Christmas? It's Christmas Eve. That's another good one. You can use that. You don't have to send any money. All right, the last riddle. Um, I don't know whether to say this one or not. I should, I should have screened this riddle, um, but I'm, I'm just going to press on. The last riddle, usually I hear applause when I say the last riddle. I hear applause. What excuse did Adam give to his children as to why they no longer lived in Eden? What excuse did Adam give his children as to why they no longer lived in Eden? Your mother ate us out of house and home. You might want to be careful how you use that, that riddle. I may already be in trouble for using it. Um, <clears throat> but you know, I, I have an idea. Since we're already talking about questions and, and, and stuff like that. I just want to try something new. Um, I don't think we've ever done this before, certainly not in a recording, but what I would like for you to do right now is I would like for you to clear your desk and take out a paper and a pencil. Clear your desk, put your Bible away, and take out a piece of paper and a pencil. Now, when's the last time you heard that? <laughs> Probably, probably been a long time. Those words used to strike fear in me every time I heard them, especially when I hadn't read the assignment. Um, but, but believe me, you, you should know these. All right, and plus, this is a true or false test, okay? So you have 50-50 you have shot. All right, so it's number on the page, 1 through 14. And the first question is, these are true or false, the phrase, now a lot of the, some of these are going to be phrases, and the question is going to be true or false, is it in the Bible? All right, question number one, true or false, the phrase, the Lord helps those who help themselves, is in the Bible. True or false? The Lord helps those who help themselves. Question number two, true or false, the phrase, charity begins at home, is in the Bible. True or false? Question number three, if I'm going too fast, just pause. The phrase, God will not give you more than you can handle, is in the Bible. So true or false is the phrase, God will not give you more than you can handle, in the Bible. Question number four, true or false. In the story of the first Christmas in the Bible, three wise men or three kings from afar come to visit baby Jesus and his parents in Bethlehem. True or false. A whale swallowed Jonah. That's question number five. Question number six, David was the second king of Israel after Saul. That's an easy one. Question number seven, true or false, the phrase money is the root of all evil is in the Bible. Money is the root of all evil is in the Bible. Question number eight, the phrase a fool and his money are soon parted is in the Bible. Question number nine, the phrase cleanliness is next to godliness is in the Bible. 
Question number 10, true or false, the phrase to thine own self be true is in the Bible. Some of these are easier than others. Um, question number 11, true or false, the phrase this too shall pass is in the Bible. Question number 12, we're almost to the end. The eye, the phrase, the eye is the window to the soul is in the Bible. True or false? Question number 13, the phrase, don't wear yourself out trying to get rich is in the Bible. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Is that in the Bible? True or false? And finally, question number 14, Scripture predicts the birth and work of a man named Josiah. True or false? Scripture predicts the birth and the work of a man named Josiah. All right, here's the answer. Question number one, um, the Lord helps those who help themselves. False, not in the Bible. Question number two, charity begins at home. Not in the Bible, false. Question number three, God will not give you more than you can handle. False, not in the Bible. Now, the Bible does say that God, God will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able to bear, but it does not say that we will not have more than we can handle. Um, question number four, true or false, first story of Christmas in the Bible, three wise men or three kings show up to visit baby Jesus. False. Well, what about all of the Christmas cards we've seen? What about the song, We Three Kings of Orient Art? The Bible never says how many. It says the gifts were gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so tradition just shows three kings bearing each one of those gifts, but it's, the number is not in the Bible. All right, um, let's see, what number was that? That was number four. Number five, a whale swallowed Jonah. False. The Bible says a fish, a great fish. It does not say a whale. We imagine it's a whale. It does not say whale. Um, question number six, David was the second king of Israel after Saul. False. False. I'm, I'm, 2 Samuel 2.10 tells us that Saul's son Ishbosheth, and they chose that name to give us trouble thousands of years later in trying to pronounce it. Um, I'm sure they must have shortened it to King Ish. But King Ish was crowned king of Israel by Abner, captain of Saul's army, after Saul's death. So, and he ruled, he actually ruled for two years. Um, question number seven, money is the root of all evil is in the Bible. Close, but false. The love of money. I'm sure half of you got that right. I wonder which half got it right. Um, the love of money is the root to all kinds of evil, but not all evil. 1 Timothy 6.10. Um, question number eight, a fool and his money are soon parted, not in the Bible, although it can be true. Um, I've seen instances, um, I won't say in my own life, but I have seen instances in which it was true. All right, question number nine, Cleanliness is next to godliness. Is that in the Bible? No. Um, question number 10, to thine own self be true. Is that in the Bible? False. It's actually Shakespeare. Um, question number 11, this too shall pass. Is that in the Bible? No. Um, even though, I want to point this out, even though Coach Mike Ditka quoted it as being from the Bible, it's not, in the, not from the Bible. All right, question number 12. The eye is the window to the soul. Is that in the Bible? False. Well, I'm sure you're beginning to say, are any of these true? We should have just written false, 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 false. All right, question number 13. The phrase, don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Is that in the Bible? True or false? True. True. We finally found one that's true. It's in Proverbs 23, verse 4, the first part of the verse. Um, question number 14, Scripture predicts the birth and work of a man named Josiah. True or false? True. And it's actually the man named Josiah that I would like to talk about a little bit this morning. Um, 
this evening, whenever you're viewing this. Josiah is one of my favorite people in the Bible. I mean, he really is. He's a fascinating person. First of all, his birth was predicted hundreds of years before he was born, which is kind of incredible. Um, and, and the circumstances, the circumstances around the prediction of his birth were when Solomon's son, remember, remember him, Rehoboam, when he became king, the kingdom was split. He got the southern kingdom of Judah, and another guy named Jeroboam, he got the northern kingdom of Israel, the bigger kingdom. And Jeroboam was not a good king. Rehoboam was not a smart king. And so one of the things that Jeroboam did is he started changing the way that the people of Israel worshiped God because he realized that if they keep going to the temple in Jerusalem, then this son of David, this, this descendant of David, is going to turn their hearts and, and they're going to they're gonna become loyal to him. So Jeroboam of Israel, he set up temples and shrines and, and began to order his people, the people of Israel, to worship in the way that he directed. And they worshiped idols. They, they, it was a system of false worship. He didn't want to, he didn't want to pattern it too closely after um, what Moses had, had handed down, what God had handed down through Moses. So we have, we have Rehoboam, Solomon's son in Judah. We have um, Jeroboam in Israel. And Jeroboam is doing bad. He's, he's doing what's evil in the sight of the Lord. And so God sends a prophet. He, uh, the scriptures call it a man of God. It's an unnamed man of God. So this guy shows up. He goes to, to see King Jeroboam. And God tells him, do not eat or drink anything while you are in Samaria, visiting Jeroboam. And so he shows up and... This, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, um, <clears throat> but the, he shows up and he says to Jeroboam, and this is a quote, he says, O altar, altar, this is what the Lord says, a child named Josiah will be born into the dynasty of David. On you, speaking to the altar, on you he will sacrifice the priests from the pagan shrines. These are the shrines that Jeroboam has set up. So this is not a compliment. Um, this is not good news to Jeroboam. He will sacrifice the priests from the pagan shrines who come here to burn incense. And human bones will be burned on you, O altar. What do you think Jeroboam's, King Jeroboam's reaction was? Well, he wasn't happy. Um, kings generally like to hear things that are complimentary, and they like to surround themselves with yes men. Um, he was furious. He said, seize him. And then his arm froze up, and he was paralyzed. And you know what the next thing he said was? Pray for me. <laughs> Pray for me. And so the man of God prays for him, and then his, his arm, his hand and his arm go back to normal. And then King Jeroboam asked the man of God to join him for a meal. The man of God flatly refuses um, and goes, goes on his way. Now fast forward to 2 Chronicles chapter 34, um, which we read um, on August on August 3rd and 4th, if you're reading along with me in the one-year Bible, um, August 3rd and 4th, we read about, that, read about this account of Josiah being born. Josiah, whose father was Ammon, Ammon, his father Ammon was a bad king. He ruled for two years, and then some of his own people killed him, assassinated him. Um, and then Josiah became king in his place. Now, Ammon, Josiah's dad, was a terrible king. He did evil in the sight of the Lord so much so that his own people assassinated him. Um, Josiah became king when he was eight years old. Think about that. Eight years old. Um, 
I believe that's second grade, about second or maybe third grade. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say the beginning of his third grade year. Um, can you imagine a nation with a leader that is still in elementary school? Well, Josiah, we're told, was eight years old when he became king of Judah. And he ruled as king of Judah for 31 years. Now, here's some good things about Josiah. He was a good king. Now, when he was 16 years old, so eight years into his rule, he began to seek the God of his ancestor, David. He had a heart for God. He was a good king, and, and he pursued God. He wanted to know about God. He wanted to, to learn all he could and to serve the God of his ancestor, David. So he began to seek the Lord. When he was 20 years old, he began to purify Judah and Jerusalem. Now, what that, what that means is he went on about a four-year campaign, and he sent, I mean, he commissioned men, and he sent men throughout the nation of Judah and throughout the city of Jerusalem, and they tore down the Asherah poles, and they, they, they just cleaned, did a lot to clean, it, to clean up the country from idol worship and and doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, when he, six years later, when he was 26 years old, and we know this from 2 Chronicles chapter 34, when he was 26 years old, he set out to restore and repair the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. Um, and verse 34, 11 says, they restored what earlier kings of Judah had allowed to fall into ruins. So that, that little verse tells us a lot. I mean, it tells us that the kings of Judah had not been following the law of the Lord. They had not been pursuing a relationship with Jehovah. Um, and they had allowed the upkeep of the temple to fall into disrepair, um, in addition to moving in idols and, and other false uh, methods of worship. Well, so Josiah sends these people over and he says, we've got to clean up, we've got to restore, we've got to do some, some remodeling, we've got to renovate the temple of the Lord. And so that's what they begin to do. Now, a funny thing happens while they're renovating the temple of the Lord. Hilkiah the priest, this is one of my favorite parts of the story, Hilkiah the priest finds the book of the law of the Lord. He finds it. Now, I don't know. Every family has losers and finders. Um, I don't know whether you're a loser or a finder, but I'm pretty sure you're one or, or the other. In my family, we have two losers and two finders. Now, losers misplace things. Where are my car keys? Where's, wh wh where did I put this? Um, the, uh, I'm a loser, okay? I, I admit it. I'm a loser. The other day, I was throwing the ball for our almost one-year-old Black Lab Holly, and I threw the ball, and it went into the shrubbery beside our house. No problem. Holly couldn't get it out. She couldn't find it, so I told Holly, sit, I'll get it. So she sat there and watched me try to find the little orange football don't draw any conclusions about the color. The little orange football, Ryan doesn't watch this, does he? We like the little orange football. It was a, it was a little orange football, but it, it went into the shrubbery. I couldn't find it. I prowled around in the shrubbery. I thought, well, maybe it went to the one on the left. It wasn't there. It went to the one on the right. I shook the shrubbery and nothing came out. And then Holly was looking at me like, well, if you can't find it, I'll find it. So she went into the shrubbery and she sniffed around. She couldn't find it. The little orange football is still lost. Would you see if Ryan has another one that I can? <clears throat> I'm a loser. Later today, I hope my wife can find the little orange football. My daughter, Lorraine, is a loser. <laughs> she's a winner, but I mean, when it comes to misplacing things, she's a loser. I remember when she... 
gosh, probably the first year that she had her cell phone, and, and that was a struggle. Should we let her have a cell phone? Everybody, everybody has a cell phone. Well, you're not everybody. Well, eventually she became everyone, and she got a cell phone. And so one day she came home from school, and she said, I've, I can't find my phone. I said, well, um, maybe you aren't old enough to have one. She didn't like that. That was not a good... You know, fathers don't provoke your children to wrath. I know that verse. That's in the Bible. Um, <clears throat> so we asked, you know, I said, well, honey, did you look for it? And she folded her arms. Of course I looked for it. Well, she said that someone at school stole it during lunch. She said she had it at lunch because, you know, I, I know from my wife, when's the last time you had it? You know, I can't do, I can't find anything, but I know the right questions to ask. When did you last have it? I had it at lunch. Um, okay, well, what did you do with it? Well, Dad, if I knew that, I'd know where it is. I walked away, and I'm pretty sure this girl named stole it. You need to call the school. Now, I'm getting an assignment, okay? Love assignments, especially assignments from... <clears throat> Anyway, so I'm getting an assignment to call the school and turn this person in and have her family contact. And I'm like, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's get one of the finders of the family. Let's get Trey or your mom to see if they can find it. Well, I know you're not going to find it because it's at school and this girl has it. And she, we can't let her get away with stealing my cell phone. Like. Tammy, <laughs> help us. So my wife came in, and she nonchalantly went over to Lorraine's lunchbox, and you guessed the end of the story. She unzipped Lorraine's lunchbox, and there was her cell phone. I'm glad I had not called the school. I'm glad we had not called the police. You know, some people are losers, and they can't, we can't help it. And some people are finders. And thank goodness that there are finders in the world. Hilkiah the priest was a finder. Now, the fact that he found the book of the law of the Lord, I just find that whole verse amazing. I mean, this is church. This is the temple of the Lord. They had lost the Bible. <laughs> In America, statistics show that the average person, the average family, has 4.1 Bibles. I wonder what the .1 part of the Bible is. But we have Bibles everywhere in America. So imagine losing, not having a copy of the Bible. Unbelievable. At church. No pew copy. Haven't had a Bible for who knows how long. What did the priest talk about? What did, in, in fact, even more than that, we know that in the book of the law of the Lord, the kings of Israel and Judah were supposed to take the law of the Lord and they were supposed to hand write it out. They were supposed to transcribe it, hand copy it. You know, like some of us did in third grade at recess, I must behave in an orderly fashion. I must behave in an orderly fashion. Some people had to do that. I'm just saying. The kings were supposed to write out the law of the Lord, and they were supposed to do it in the presence of the scribes. Not only that, but once they wrote it out word for word with the scribes looking over their shoulder, making sure that they got it right and didn't say, you know, the Ten Suggestions rather than the Ten Commandments, um, then the king was supposed to carry that with them at all times. It was supposed to be like, you know, the President of the United States has what's called a nuclear briefcase or a nuclear notebook that they carry along with the codes in case the President has to launch a nuclear strike, something we don't like to think about. But um, the kings of Israel and Judah were supposed to carry their copy, their personal copy that they had handwritten of the book of the law of the Lord with them so that they could rule 
justly and so that they wouldn't become proud and so that they wouldn't take too many wives and so they wouldn't get rich. So they would follow all of the guidelines, all of the commandments that God had given the people of Israel. That's what they were supposed to do. So the fact that Josiah, he's a good king and he's been making all of these improvements, but he's been doing it just on gut just from gut instincts, maybe things that some other people have taught him, hearsay. But Hilkiah the priest finds the book of the law of the Lord. I, that, that's just, that's absolutely incredible. And here's, here's the even bigger thing, they read it. Hilkiah the priest hands it to the king's man, and the king's man reads it, and he takes it back to the king, and he reads it to the king, and Josiah, listens and it didn't you know it, it took longer than just is it took longer than just 10 or 15 minutes it took hours to read the king cleared his schedule that day he had all of his calls held all of his appointments canceled and he listened to the law of the lord being read to him and you know what he did he tore his clothes that, that was a sign of just utter despair. He ripped his clothes and he said, we have not been doing everything that this book says we should do. He was a good king. He was trying. But when they found God's Word, he realized there are things that I didn't even know about. So he sends his men to the prophet Hulda, and the prophet Hulda gives them instructions. I mean, the king is repenting, and, and he's torn his clothes. He's sitting down in ashes, and she tells him that because you, the Lord said, because you have reacted this way, this will not happen. All of the bad things that, that the book of the law of the Lord, all of the curses, you know, there were blessings and there were curses. If you follow my commandments, you will be blessed beyond belief. But if you, but if you, if you refuse to obey me, if you turn your back on me, says the Lord, then these curses will come down on you. And the prophet Huldah says, this will not happen in your lifetime. So here, here's what Josiah did. Now remember, he's already been on a four to six year campaign of purifying Judah the country Judah and especially the city Jerusalem, the capital, um, he sends some people to the temple of the Lord. This is 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 4 and 7. He goes, he sends them, and they remove the rest of the idols from the temple. What were they even still doing in the temple of the Lord? Why was their attention still divided? Why was their worship still, why were there still things above God and their life? I don't know. But God's Word illuminated that. And so all of the idols, every one of them, came out of the temple of the Lord. Then, now I'm, I'm embarrassed to even say this, but it was in the Bible. And so this is verse 7 of 2 Kings chapter 23. They tore down the living quarter of the male and female shrine prostitutes. What? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. They tore down the living quarters of the male and female shrine prostitutes. That's, that's how far off course the country had drifted without God's Word. What happened next is really incredible. King Josiah called the entire country to come to Jerusalem, and he assembled the people, and he read, he had everyone listen to the entire book of the law of the Lord. It took hours, but they all stood there listening. And they realized, because God's Word is illuminating, God's Word is convicting, um, you know, if you, if, if you don't want to find out something to change about your life, then stay away from God's Word because it's like holding up a mirror and you see God's Word and you see yourself and you go, 
I'm not doing everything that it says. Um, and that's what happened. There was, there was revival. People repented. And the next thing that Josiah instituted was he said, we're going to celebrate the Passover. We're going to do it big time. We're going to invite Israel. We're going to invite everybody, everybody. And so Scripture tells us that this was an epic Passover celebration. 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 25 says, Never before had there been a king like Josiah, who turned to the Lord with all his heart and soul and strength, obeying all the laws of Moses. Wow. 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 Can you think of any other countries? that may have strayed a little bit from God's Word? Can you think of any countries that may be neglecting two or three or more of the Ten Commandments or some of the other commandments about morality that are in God's Word? I can. I can think of a lot of countries. The Bible, and, and, and here just in closing, people always like to hear in closing, and, and this is really in closing. I've known preachers that would say in closing, and then 25 minutes later, <laughs> this is short. This is the end. Here's the takeaway. First one, there are not many. There are not 14 like there were 14 questions. God's people need God's Word, okay? God's people need God's Word. We have it. That's the good news. We have 4.1 copies of it. God's people need His Word. The second takeaway is that we cannot do everything that God wants us to do without His Word. We can't do it. I've read it before. (laughs) There's too much in it. We need to be constantly immersed in it. Um, Revival happened in Josiah's day because God's people found and read and acted on God's Word. Now, we might know where our Bibles are, but finding it means blowing the dust off of it. I know a lot of, most of you, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to the choir, but here's what. The choir has children. The choir has grandchildren. Some of the choir members have great-grandchildren, and the choir has neighbors and friends, and not everyone is reading God's Word. We need to set an example. We need to be engaged and submersed in it and encourage others to do the same. Uh, the fourth takeaway, whatever your reading ability is, you know, I don't like to read, you know, I'm not a real good reader, um, I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to, to complete it. Uh, a single once a week serving of God's Word is not enough. Not enough. It's better than nothing. A daily devotion that has one verse and breaks it down and tells you what it means so you don't have to think is good. Is good. It's not enough. Um, do you know what one of the reasons that Christians don't read the Bible? You know, you know one of the biggest reasons? I asked a friend of mine who is an atheist. We were talking about Christians one day. And, and by the way, he knows I'm a Christian. Um, I've told him my testimony, and we've talked about what it means to be a Christian. I've encouraged him to believe. But, but one day I asked him, um, why do you think it is that most Christians have never read the Bible all the way through? Research indicates that 20% of people that call themselves Christians have read the whole Bible. 80% have not. And I said, gee, why is it that Christians who upper 90 percentile say the Bible's true, upper 90 percentile say that it, it's um, important to them personally, but only 30 or 40 percent of them engage with the Bible or read it weekly, and only 20 percent have ever read the whole thing? said, why do you think that is? And smart guy. In fact, he knows, he's, 
he's more Bible literate than some believers that I've known, present company excluded, of course. Um, but he said, you know, Bill, I think that it's probably because they think that they already know what it says. Especially people that have been in church, that grew up in church, they think they already know what it says. I think that's profound. All right, the last takeaway, okay? I told you it wouldn't be 25 minutes. That wasn't 25 minutes. The last takeaway is along about this time every year, sometimes it's a little later, but um, since we're not meeting every week and I'm not able to see you in person and, and jump in front of the microphone when Dr. Phillips steps out of the room for a minute, I, I, I wanna do this now. I, I wanna take this opportunity to challenge you to read the Bible. Now, there are lots of methods you can take your own Bible. You can take the Bible, the Gideon Bible that you got when you were in the fifth grade and, and read that until you're through. There are no bad methods of reading the Bible. Or, I, and I preface this by saying I am not a Gideon, okay? But I will give you a one-year Bible. How much, will, how, how much will it cost, Bill? Let's understand what gift means. It is free, but I'm not a Gideon. So I will give anyone a copy of the Bible, the one-year Bible, with their commitment to read the Bible through in a year. It takes 15, 20 minutes. I don't know how fast people read. It takes me longer because I just start underlining and I go, wow. I, I saw something new this morning that I didn't realize was there. It, it spoke to me. And so I had to underline that. Pretty soon I'm gonna have to get a new one-year Bible and start underlining all over again. But I will give you, I will give them a one-year Bible. I'm ordering more cases. I have faith that more of God's people will want to commit to reading God's Word. You say, well, you know, I've read it years ago. I mean, I've even had, I've even had Christians tell me, I read it and you know, I, I, there's just so much there. I then you might need to read it a second time or a third time or a fourth time, but I will give you a one-year Bible. This is what it looks like. I use the New Living Translation. It will be free. How can you get it? Um, well, I don't think there's a phone number at the bottom of your screen, but what you can do is call the church office and just tell Christy or whoever answers the phone, put my name down on the list for the one-year Bible, Bill Hazelton. Give the list to Bill Hazelton. And what I will do is I will, I will get those one-year Bibles to you. I will get them to the church and you can swing by and pick them up. We will find a way to get the Bible to you. But I'm, I'm serious about this. Other than becoming a Christian, other than repenting of my sins and putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, engagement with His Word has been the biggest um, fuel of my Christian growth. And why do I encourage Bible reading? I want you to grow exponentially in your faith. I want all believers to grow exponentially in their faith. It'll bless you. You'll find things. It, it'll become, if you do it regularly, it'll become a habit and it'll be the best part of your day. The best part of your day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this time together. Lord, I pray that you would bless the hearing of, of what you've put on my heart. Lord, I pray that, that all of your people would engage with your word. Lord, we thank you that your word is living and that it's active and that it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And Lord, send the Holy Spirit to, to draw us all closer to you through your word. Lord, I pray your special blessings on each one that is hearing this recording. Lord, please let them know how special they are to me and to you. For it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen.